Hello everybody and welcome to our second EV and Battery Outlook session of this seminar series. My name is Alicia Bennett, I'm the Marketing and Membership Manager here at Rowmotion. And before handing over to today's speakers, I just want to give you a brief introduction to Rowmotion and our services. So headquartered in London, Rowmotion offers comprehensive, well-informed analysis of the energy transition. And this is delivered through our multi-client subscription and focus reports, single client consultancy and advisory, the membership platform, events such as this one, and a magazine. The multi-client subscriptions are delivered monthly, quarterly, and annually. The monthly data sets and reports consist of the EV battery chemistry assessment, battery energy stationary storage assessment, our EV charging assessment, as well as the EV and battery database. The quarterly outlooks are made up of the EV and battery outlook, our EV charging outlook, as well as the battery energy stationary storage outlook. And we also deliver a number of focus reports, such as the ones you can see on your screen now. This seminar and, well, in fact, all of our past webinars and presentations are available to stream on demand on the Rowmotion membership platform. So this platform also provides news and analysis on the EV and battery and charging and infrastructure industries and includes pieces such as our China briefing and live EV sales numbers. It's also used as an access portal by our members to download their subscription products. If you'd like to find out more about the membership platform or indeed any of the Rowmotion products, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with my colleague, Crispin, uh, Crispin McCutcheon, using the details on screen. Right, I know you'll be keen to hear from today's speakers, so I'm going to hand you over to Adam Panayi now, who is our session host. Enjoy the seminar, thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, lovely introduction to what we do there. I'm delighted to be joined by Leonardo and Apostolos from the IEA today, who are gonna to talk us through uh, their outlooks for various things, in fact, but looking at EV and battery uh, as we did this morning, but they have a slightly different angle on it. So it'd be interesting to hear their thoughts. Some of the critical materials going into that and the supply chain issues that are around there, there they are. And also uh, the broader energy transition and also the broader energy market as well. Obviously the IEA is very well placed to, to talk about uh, some of these uh, dynamics and um, we're delighted to have them with us. And it's also nice to see two people sat in an office together uh, as colleagues as well, even, even if it has to be, mean that you wear masks. But um, as ever, this session is being recorded and non-members will be given access to this later in the week uh, for a week. There is a link in the chat as well for our final session today, which is a battery technology session, which is going to be very worthwhile attending. So you, if you haven't signed up for that, please do. And then finally, before I uh, hand over, uh, the Q&A box there that you can see at the bottom of your screen is where you ask your questions to Leonardo and Apostolos. Uh, they'll be delighted to, um, to answer them and we'll get through as many as we can. But with that, I'm going to hand over to our guest speakers from the IA. Please take it away. Hello, good afternoon. We're just checking. Is everything all right with the screen sharing? It looks great. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so good afternoon, uh, everyone. We're pleased to, to present our work uh, in this uh, seminar series. Uh, we uh, are going to talk about some of the uh, key reports that the IA has published uh, this year. So namely the Global Electric Vehicles Outlook 2021, the Criticals Materials Report, as well as the um, Roadmap to Net Zero Emissions in 2050. So this, all the content we're going to talk about is uh, taken from these uh, key reports. Now, I will begin uh, just by talking a bit about the uh, trends in the electric vehicle markets in 2020 and what have been the drivers uh, and sort of the, the key moving uh, sort of levers uh, in our opinion. So just to begin with a few numbers, uh, we've had as of the end of 2020, uh, over 10 million electric vehicles uh, on the road. That, uh, and that is uh, sort of a sale of over 3 million vehicles just in 2020. This is a, is a large increase, a 41% increase over 2019, despite 
the really strong impacts uh, of the pandemic on the overall car market, which has uh, declined by, by 15%. Um, the uh, overall sort of the overall structure of the electric vehicle market sales in 2020 has also uh, changed with uh, having a very big increase in sales uh, in Europe, which has reached a market size for electric vehicles that is similar to the one that, uh, that of China and actually surpassed it. And uh, all of this now in spite of, uh, of the pandemic, as mentioned earlier. Uh, just to say, it's not just electric vehicles that have uh, sort of increased and that are sort of moving. So it is not just cars uh, that are moving towards electrifications. There's other modes. Uh, in fact, the mode that has the most sales uh, of electric power trains are two and three wheeler, wheelers with over 25 million sales in 2020, but also the heavier um, heavier modes and heavier vehicles are quickly electrifying. But when we when we overlay sort of a geographical distribution uh, over these sales, we see that for both two and three wheelers and the heavier uh, heavier vehicles, uh, China is really the, the core market. Whereas for cars and other light duty uh, duty vehicles, there is more of uh, of a geographical um, just, let's say heterogeneity in the in the sales. Something that uh, we like to highlight every 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 year, we estimate the uh, size of the electric vehicle market, and we divide it in consumer spending and government spending. We estimated uh, 120 billion uh, US dollars of expenditure from consumers onto electric vehicles. This is a 50% increase over 2019, mostly driven by the higher number of sales, but also because uh, of a higher average price of the vehicles uh, that have been sold in 2020 compared to 2019. However, as said, it is not just cons consumers that spend on electric vehicles, it is also governments. Governments spend on electric vehicles uh, through direct subsidies, as well as, uh, let's say, fiscal incentives. And we have estimated uh, 14 billion um, 14 billion of expenditure from governments uh, on the electric vehicle market. This has not been the same for all regions. Actually, in, uh, um, in places like China and the United States, we've estimated a decrease in government spending, but this has been more than made up by very uh, sort of by much larger spending in Europe due to both higher volumes of sales and uh, higher incentives during the course of 2020. And if we look at the ratio of the um, of government uh, spending in the overall EV market, it is still on a decreasing trend as it's been since 2015 that suggests that the EV market is slowly getting uh, becoming less and less dependent on, uh, on government subsidies, despite sort of the, the increase uh, in 2020. Something else uh, I'd like to draw your attention to is the, um, let's say, the technical characteristics of the EVs that have been sold and the variety of model availability. We've had a 40% increase in the number of models that are available worldwide uh, with an electric powertrain, most of which uh, are pure battery electric vehicles. And uh, we've also observed a, sort of a long-term increase in the range of the average vehicle sold. However, in 2020, we've seen um, sort of a plateauing uh, of this trend, uh, sort of sitting at about 350 kilometers, whereas for plug-in um, plug hybrid uh, cars, the range seems to still be at around 50 kilometers without any sort of uh, particular sign of decreasing uh, or increasing. When we look at the different markets, there are fairly big uh, differences. And the, the main, let's say that the most important difference is the number of EVs that are available in the various market. In China, there are roughly 200 different models from which um, consumers can choose from. In the European Union, there's roughly um, roughly 100, and about half of that um, is available in the United States. When we look at the different segments, we see that uh, there's a large number of uh, SUV electric cars that are available. That is roughly 50% or slightly more, uh, but this is more or less in line with the overall car market, except in, in Europe, where there are slightly more heavy electric vehicles uh, than there are heavy conventional vehicles in terms of model availability. Also, when we look at the different powertrains, we see that battery electric vehicles are fairly available across the board, while plug-in hybrids are still mostly concentrated uh, among the larger segments of the market. Now, just to say um, sort of a little recap as to why we think 2020 has been such an exceptional year for, for EVs. 
and there are sort of three reasons. The first one is, uh, or I mean, the order, let's say, we're not, I mean, the order is not the, the key part, but let's say there is the increased model availability and sort of the push from OEMs to, to bring in the market uh, new and uh, more appealing vehicles. Then there is the fact that there is a pre existing policy uh, environment that has pushed sort of uh, the adoption of EVs that I'm going to talk to you about now. And then the third one has been an increase in the uh, incentives that governments have given, especially uh, sort of in the European region. Uh, while for uh, for China, for example, there's all, there's been a decrease in the incentives, but actually a um, there's been a prolongation of the of the uh, of the subsidies that were supposed to finish in 2020. So now, if I just look, just wanted to walk you through the importance of the the three types of of government policies that are used across the, the major uh, car markets to subsidize EVs. The first ones are fuel economy standards or CO2 standards. So these, for example, are those that have been really important in the European Union to to uh, push uh, the, the sort of push EVs um, to these high levels in 2020 because of the of the emission uh, standard of 95 grams per 100 kilometers as a as a corporate average. But these are existent in in other countries as well. Then there are the ZEV mandates. These have sort of started uh, in California uh, back back in in the 90s, uh, but are still very important, especially in China with the the NEV. Uh, credit mandate, and then the third are the purchase incentives that are also present in most uh, in most countries, and as I mentioned earlier, have had uh, sort of a big impact in uh, on on the EV market. Now, just a, a few words on of sort of our understanding of uh, of the the battery market and the, and the trends related to batteries. So the first one, uh, just in terms of cathodes, uh, in two thousand and twenty, we have. And it's in, in our in our scenarios, we've got like three three main things. The first one is the increased share of high nickel cathodes. This has been going on for a while. It's not a sort of a new trend, but we see it uh, continuing to go uh, to go on. We've also see this interesting comeback of LFP cathodes, driven by technological uh, sort of breakthroughs in China that have made this um, this chemistry more appealing. And then also we see sort of in the near future. Some of the solid state batteries that sort of are, are gonna are gonna come into the market sort of we, we believe before 2030 we don't have a specific date uh, but of course in the more the more ambitious are our climate scenarios the more necessary it is for these um let's say innovative batteries to, to hit the market as soon as possible in terms of our estimate of uh, battery demand over the years, we see roughly 160, so between 150 and 160 uh, gigawatt hours per year of uh, battery demand. And this is mostly driven by, uh, by cars. But then we, uh, when we look at the geographical distribution, China still has the highest uh, demand for batteries, according to our estimates, mostly because of their um, high market share of uh, buses, uh, electric buses that require large uh, battery packs. Now, just a few words on um, sort of on the material implications, and then I will pass on the word uh, to my colleague that will sort of bring you a bit more uh, forward into the future in our in our work. So um, when we look at the, what are the materials implication of, of uh, electrification? So the first thing we have here is the, uh, is, is the number of materials that are required for an electric car compared to a conventional car. We see it's six times higher. So this is not about steel and aluminium. It's really about uh, the key key materials that are required for the energy transition. So there's copper in there, um, there is nickel, manganese, uh, and, and all the other battery materials, and that's six times uh, higher in a in an electric car. It is not just electric cars that sort of in the transition matter for uh, for material demand. It is also power generation. Here we have sort of a few of our uh, of our estimates. We see that there's uh, a much much higher requirement uh, for uh, for raw materials in renewable technologies and low carbon technologies compared to some of the fossil fuels um, power generation technologies. And in fact, in the past decade, the material intensity of new uh, of new electricity generation has increased by 50 percent because of the uh, advent of um, of low carbon technologies. So this is uh, all from me. I will now pass on the word uh, to my colleague uh, Apostolos, uh, and he will speak to you more about our future, uh, our vision of the future. Oh, no, actually, sorry.
there is another element I wanted to, to mention, which is about the supply, the current supply and the of the materials. We see uh, something. This matters for um, this matters for energy security, and uh, we have compared, for example, the um, um, the supply from the from the top three producing countries of the three uh, of some of the key uh, critical materials with uh, key uh, oil and gas, uh, so the three key oil and gas producers, and we see that the top three producer countries have higher shares for these critical materials compared to the fossil fuels. The concentration of um, let's say geographical concentration is not just an issue of extraction, but also of processing. And when we look at the material processing capacity, we see that uh, for the uh, these sort of uh, critical materials, there's a there's a much higher concentration in uh, in just a few countries compared than for uh, fossil fuel resources. And so this just um, sort of goes to show that you know. We, we will have to, to pay attention to, to energy security, even though it will be sort of declined, not just into, into oil and gas, but also into more materials uh, when going into the future and when we're being serious about the energy transition. And now I will pass on the word. Yeah, many thanks, Leonardo. Hello, everyone, also from my side. So as you all are probably you are aware of, like 12 out of 14 biggest economies in the world and over 100 companies which produce and also consume energy, they have declared net zero pledges. Some of them, they're targeted to aim, they're aiming to, to achieve this target by 2050, some a little bit earlier or later, but also like we are all, always know that 2050, it's also a target year. For this reason, in this year, we started preparing and we released recently a comprehensive uh, publication focused about what is necessary to be done in order to reach net zero emissions by 2050 at a global level for the energy sector. Jumping also a little bit on what Leo had mentioned that. What Leo presented previously. In terms of critical material, there is a huge need for demand. We see a four times increase at its needed in our sustainable development scenario, which achieves net zero by 2070. So it's two decades later than compared to NZD by 2040. Most of the demand, it comes from the battery side, but there are a lot of uh, needs that it's necessary to come from the electricity network. network. And we're talking about a uh, grid enhancement. Also, we are aware that a lot of part of the world, they lack of electricity. So there is also great expansion on this end. And also it's included also the infrastructure needs for a fast chargers for electric vehicles. So once again, we do expect a big growth on all of different raw materials. Lithium, it's much more intense, the growth and graphite and also cobalt. It's a little bit less on the rare earth side, but of course we recognize that all this like uh, the new topic the the new formulation of the energy sector it's necessary to be fueled with uh, raw materials in terms of the mismatch between supply and also the needs that we have from the demand side we do see exponential growth and especially on lithium and cobalt material on copper it's much more modest because there is also the efficiency component that when you, you electrify, you gain also a lot of, of less demand on the service demand compared to it's covered higher part of the service demand there due to efficiency implications there. And also, of course, there is also the element about how quickly you can scale up your production there. Of course, apart from the raw material side and the EVs, a huge transition it's necessary to be done in the whole energy sector. Especially the coming decade, it's essential if we want to achieve the net zero by mid in the mid century. So in terms of power generation, we need to increase heavily the installation of solar and wind by 2030, sur surpassing 1000 gigawatt installations in the coming decade. This is translated to a four times increase compared to today's level. And this it has been already done in the past. So over the coming decade, we have increased four times the installation of solar and wind, and we went 
we want to repeat that in the future in order to be aligned with this trajectory. A huge transition, it has to be done also in the electrical sales side. We need to move from market shares that is 4.6 in 2020 to surpass 60% in 2030. In simple words, this is translated that we, we need to convert the whole world like in a market that like Norway or Iceland today, more or less. And this it has also a big implications on the battery demand needs and also on the raw material needs. The last piece that is also important is about energy efficiency. A lot of energy efficiency measures are dedicated for industry and especially for buildings when we were talking about retrofitting of the stock. And it's necessary to be done and it's an only regret option in order to, to reach this target for the coming decade and also to reach net zero by 2050. Zooming into a little bit on the transport side, I mean, today, transport sector consumes around 90% of the consumption It's dedicated to oil products, but this is, has to be changed. In 2030, this 90% is moving to 75% and slightly higher than 10% by 2050. Most of the shift is happening to electricity, especially coming from the road modes there. And by early 2040s, electricity will become the dominant fuel. The share of electricity is going to increase to reach nearly 45% in 2050, up from less than 1.5% today. And we are talking now about direct electrification. In direct electrification, for example, hydrogen-based fuels are going to be directed mainly to long-distance transport. For example, heavy trucks, also aviation, ammonia, and shipping are good candidates in order to, to achieve this target. And bioenergy, of course, is going to, to play a key role. 60% of the total transport consumption in 2050 it will be biofuels and uh, biomethane. And there is a shift that instead of using that directly to road, because for road, the main case is electrification, it's going to be, to be directed to long distance tr transport, especially aviation and also shipping. As Leonardo described also before, I mean, EVs is a key component of this transition. Over the last decade, we have seen a decline on battery costs over 90%. We have seen a lot of OEMs declare that they are planning to phase out ICs. We have seen also announcements from governments like UK and recently Canada supporting also this transition. And in our outlook, we do see that battery electric vehicles will be the key component and dominant technology for light duty vehicles. We are talking now about cars, light trucks, and two, three wheelers. For this, dominantly, we see that mainly it will be a shift uh, to battery electric and fuel cells are going to play a limited role on the car market, in only concentrated in certain markets, but it will have a higher potential, especially for heavy trucks. Heavy trucks, we are talking about that mainly for a distance trip that are over 400 kilometers per day, in which in these cases, fuel cells, it's a competitive option relative to battery electric ones due to the, the high range need there. In terms of the technological aspect and what kind of technologies are needed in order to reach this target, in order to reach, like to cut 12 gigatons CO2 in 2000, by 2030, in order to be aligned with 1.5 degree scenario by 2050, we have already more than less technologies there. It's efficiency, electrification of cars, so it's already available. But when we are moving to the long term and to reaching the net zero targets, a lot of things are necessary to be done. And we have assessed that around 50% of the technologies that, that are needed are still under development. We are talking about some demonstration projects, for example, solid state batteries, next generation batteries, for example, CCUS, direct air and capsule, hydrogen production at a low cost via electrolysis, and also advanced biofuels. So all these components are necessary to bring them in the market in order to achieve the net zero targets. How this is possible? With a lot of mobilization of investments, especially on R&D, we are estimating that this is needed 90 billion 
to be directed to the demonstration by 2030. This is three to four times higher compared to what the governments have already declared uh, in, in now in their budgets. And also an another important aspect, it's also the international cooperation. It's really hard, a unique market to reach all this, to make all this market uh, to, to, to reach carbon neutrality without having benefited from the economies of scales and all the improvements that are necessary in order to follow this course. Apart from the quantitative analysis in our report, we always also looked at putting in place quite a few milestones, over 400 milestones that are necessary in order to, to reach a neutral a carbon neutral economy by 2050. We have covered extensively all the different energy sectors and we looked on the recent developments on that and the possibility of the technologies that are needed to penetrate in the market. Few examples of that is that, for example, we are talking about a share of electric cars to, to reach 60% by 2030, no new IC car sales in mid-30s, a, a huge deployment of uh, sustainable aviation fuel and also improvements on hydrogen side and also on the power generation. Focusing a little bit on the hydrogen side, by 2030 we are talking about 850 gigawatt electrolyzer. This is eight times higher than the number that they have on the project that are already on the pipeline for the coming decade. In terms of the Generation side, we have already the technology we're talking about solar mainly and wind, and we, such, we succeed to achieve the, the net zero by 2030 at the global level. Five, five years early it's coming on the advanced economies. And by 2050, we have 90% of the production, it comes from the renewables, 70% it's from solar and wind, and the remaining, we are talking about fossil fuels that are coupled with CCUS or hydrogen based. Uh, or they're using hydrogen uh, for the, the production of the conventional uh, power plants. And as Leonardo described a little bit before, I mean, this shift, apart from the huge implication for oil and gas industry, it, it resuffles also the energy security aspect. In the past, we are talking about oil and gas security issues. But there is in our NZD scenario, in the net zero scenario, you have a huge drop on oil and supply. And of course, like low cost producers are going to play a higher role there on the share, but the total quantity it's, it's much lower. A big increase is coming, especially from critical minerals. We have seen that over the, over the coming decades, by 2050, we have seven, seven times higher demand of critical minerals there. And also, of course, there is also the aspect of uh, electricity security. Electricity is going to be on the core on the future economy. We have seen, as we presented previously, that electricity will be the key component for transport sector. This is happening also for buildings at a less extent on industry. So there is a huge demand from electricity, but what it says, it's mainly how it's produced from dispatchable technologies. In the past, now you have technologies that they cannot produce any time. So depending on the on when the wind blows and when there is sun there. So there is huge need of increasing of the flexibility needs. We are estimating that four times increase. And how it's covered, it's, it's going to be covered mainly from batteries. From 20 gigawatt, it's going to reach to surpass 3,000 gigawatt in the future. Interconnection between different uh, electricity system and also some dispatchal uh, units that will be all, uh, will be also operating at this period of time, but coupled with CCUS. And of course, this huge transition to electromobility it brings also a big increase on the battery demand in our outlook we 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 project that to surpass 7000 uh, seven terawatt hours per year by 2030 and to reach around 14 by 2050 compared to the announcement 
from the abandoned the manufacturer if this this is for the coming decade it's almost double the size so it's necessary to scale up quickly the 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 production there in order to be uh, in the course that it's aligned with the carbon neutral economy in the future and that's it from our side I'm happy to to address your questions Just come back on there. Thank you both very much. It was uh, really interesting and, you know, useful wide sort of range of topics covered there. I, I've got a few questions that we can get into detail on uh, to start with. <clears throat> I know that you guys said that you, there's a big team of you working on this stuff, so you may not be able to cover everything. But on the two and three wheeler piece, I mean, that's something that we've we spent some time thinking about. And how do you see the battery market dynamics developing there? Because uh, you know, a big part of that market is lead acid. Do you see much of that going over to lithium iron or, or, or what do you think is going to happen in the two and three wheeler market? Uh, I can. Yeah, yeah. Please go so in the two, three wheeler market, we um, so we don't have a very sort of strong opinion on it, but uh, let's say that what we think is the most likely uh, scenario is to see a slow uh, increase of the, of the lithium iron battery in, in the developing um, in the developing countries where now the, the bulk of the market is whereas for the um developed uh, economies we see this sort of shift happening uh more fast or you know as as the new as the new models uh, come up and the market increases they should sort of start already with uh with lithium ion so this is sort of our our, our main outlook but we do see this sort of happening gradually over the course uh, of this decade yeah i think i broadly agree with that because um if you look at the use case in the developing world, I mean, basically China and Southeast Asia, India, the lead acid piece covers most of what people need to do for now in the performance sector, you know, with, as, as the economy grows and people get richer and so on, then that will be more appropriate there. And then in the developed world, again, the motorbike market or the two, three wheeler market is much more geared towards performance. Anyway, it makes sense that that would go over to lithium. I think something that could, could be interesting for the two, three wheeler market is if in the future, um, so the automotive market starts, uh, let's say, let's say the batteries for the automotive market are going to be more varied, and so we're going to have more batteries that are designed for, um, uh, for let's say, cheaper cars. These could be better suited sort of lithium-ion batteries for the two-three-wheeler market as well, yeah. since probably the performance requirements aren't you know as high as the let's say the high performance that is required for uh, for the automotive uh, market. Yeah. Yeah, specifically probably LFP and a few others because of the yeah. safety as well as much something else. Exactly. There was something that you mentioned, Apostolos, which is around uh, copper demand and efficiency. So you showed your outlook for copper demand and it was relatively modest compared to virtually everything else. Uh, and you mentioned the point about efficiency. Could you just clarify what you mean by that? Because yeah, it, it's mainly about how the future demand is going to be covered. So for example, because electrification has a huge higher efficiency in terms of covering higher part of the service demand mm -hmm. so shifting to that it's you gain a lot of also from uh, from the demands perspective yeah. okay yeah interesting because because the other the other piece we're seeing as well is that um, the use in the vehicle and the cabling harness and that's sort of, is, is getting more efficient as well so the, for both lightweighting and cost purposes so uh, yeah, but it's interesting that that's also yeah but also from the if this perspective is that we haven't reached uh, currently the range in order to penetrate massively in the market so even if you gain you will have some additional battery needs mm -hmm. in order to make that as a business case for everybody like to increase because you need always to reach a higher range so it comes you need bigger batteries from that so even if you compensate that with the efficiency on the on the EVs market so uh, the, the the total amount it will be all, always it will be positive on this end Sure, yeah, absolutely, on, on that basis. Um, one final question for me, and then I'll go to the audience because I'm waiting. Uh, I did notice there was people raising hands. If you could just, if you have a question, just put it in the Q&A and we'll, we'll get it answered. But um, on oil supply, you showed that uh, 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 effectively a, a drop in oil supply over time in, in one of the latest slides. Now, my question was really, is that because demand drops off or is that is there something uh, on the supply side that's happening in the oil market that would lead that to happen? 
So uh, is on one of your slides. Apart. Sorry, uh, I mean I didn't got the question. It was for dedicated for all materials. So it was on the uh, there was there was a chart you showed with oil supply over time. Uh, oil supply, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, on the one side, it it comes mainly from demand. Okay. Because I mean you have shift directly to electrification, huge penetration of low carbon fuels like hydrogen based and also biofuels and bioenergy. So you have a huge drop, but then on the other side, because it's much more niche the market there, the producers that are going to play a role, a role there, we see that OPEC is going to increase their share because it's traditional producer and they can produce that with existing infrastructure and also at, at a really low cost. Yeah. For this reason, even if it's declining there, you see that it has a bigger room from these markets to increase their share. But at the absolute value, also they, they will have a huge drop on, on their production capability with big implication on their uh, revenues. Because many countries from this from this part of the world, they rely heavily on revenues coming from oil and gas industry. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That does sort of stand to reason when you think it through that you know most of the very low cost production is OPEC based and it's going to be limited room for new investments in in higher cost uh, facilities okay let's go to the floor so um this is a question that you may or may not have uh, an answer for around your outlet for supply of graphite both natural and synthetic i mean i can talk around this as well but maybe if you guys want to put your opinion forward if you have one uh, i think the the two of it, as i were mentioning it was other colleagues of ours that yeah, dealt in, let's say, to the to the the bits and bolts of the critical materials report so we don't have a specific uh i think we, i don't think we can give a particular insights on the graphite uh, market okay what i will say it allows me then to give a plug for our seminar tomorrow morning which <laughs> where we have Tauga and zero resources speaking so if you're interested in the graphite market you can i would say that's very worth attending just to my mind i think that in very broad terms um, if you'd asked that question maybe two or three years ago, we would have said the natural flake would really have to take up a big portion of the market to make this viable. But what has happened in, in the last sort of 18 months is there has been a big increase in synthetic supply in China. And also you're going to see big increases, well, not see big increases, but you're going to see increases in synthetic capacity in the Western world as well in the coming years as well. So it looks like that outlook might be slightly more balanced between synthetic and natural than had previously been assumed. Um, had a question here. Uh, how does your battery forecast take into account the challenge of uh, sustainably sourcing raw materials? And I think that's because um, I noticed that one of your targets for EV penetration was probably a little bit higher than ours. Uh, but so one of the one of the caveats we use is around availability of raw materials. But please, um, if, if you if you would like to get into that, uh, you think I can? Yeah. yeah. Um, so in the so let, let's be sort of to have to distinguish. We have the sustainable development scenario, which is what uh, the results of the critical materials report have been uh, based on. Um, and uh, there already we see sort of some sort of, especially in the short term, some some problems between supply and demand hmm. uh, occurring during the course uh, of this decade. Um, however, we do not see a long term let's, or let's say a, a non movable bottleneck in terms of material supply. So when we look at our long term projections, we do not have um so we do not take material considerations are sort of something that would block the world from from moving in a, to a, to a, to clean energy um, however of course this is really 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 important in the short term and we do uh, one of our policy recommendations is for governments to ensure that uh, the supply chains are uh, sort of are well uh, sort of well alive and able to supply uh, the the ambitions uh, that we do have now when we look at the net zero report here the the volumes increase uh, sort of uh, even more and uh, as apostolos mentioned we have uh, sort of around 6.6 uh, .6, if i remember correctly th uh, terawatt hours of battery demand by 2030 so this is really really a huge huge increase mm. and in that case of course this exacerbates the issue of the of the supply chain and in that case of course there, there are multiple uh, and other multiple ways to to try to address this either having cars that might have smaller batteries so of course the you know, supply and demand can balance themselves we could have uh, different um, different battery uh, chemistries that come up to, to sort of um, 
to sort of you know use different materials. Uh, this sort of could could maybe be a push towards more the iron based uh, ca cathodes that could sort of have you know have less constraints on the on the supply side. Um, so definitely, you know, it is something that we consider to be critical. But if we want to meet the the climate target and the, and the pledges that governments are are doing, of course, you know, efforts need to be made, and the market will have to to move to to supply the the materials that are that are required. I guess in the long term, I suppose the argument is that the investment will be found. But I, I do agree that in the short, and I'll probably say in the medium term as well, that there is a a uh, a restriction put on the growth of the market. Just Availability of materials. But um, question this is maybe a bit of a curve. It's actually from my colleague Iola. So, do you see a place for hydrogen combustion within the heavy duty market? He talks about fuel cell in the, high, in the heavy duty market. Very much agree with that. Something that's come up in discussions we've been having recently is about hydrogen combustion. I don't know if that's something that's crossed your, uh, your radar. Yeah, I mean, the, the point of that is that in order to produce hydrogen at a reasonable cost, you will need minimum one decade for that. So we do see a hydrogen to be able to produce at a low cost. And now we are talking mainly from for green hydrogen, right? Or like coupling with CCUS just in order to do that. So you need a few, a few years there on this. I mean, in our outlook, we, we see a huge advantage coming from batteries and also fuel cells because there is also the component of air pollution on, on this end there that it, you are benefited also from this from this shift but we don't see that it will be a norm like that you are using hydrogen uh, bearing that on the conventional engines especially for uh, we're talking about what is happening on the car uh, on the heavy duty vehicles market i mean we see, for example, ammonia to play a role for shipping at using like a conventional engine there that it's like it has a potential to burn ammonia, but we, we do expect that other solutions to be there. And of course, we have also biofuel that it compete the hydrogen, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, you, you are like as a strategy, if a country goes like keeping the existing infrastructure, it depending also how quickly can scale up the production of hydrogen at which cost, when to bring that on the market, and how competitive it will be versus other like what is happening on the bioenergy market, right? Mm. And may I just add one point on the TRL? Uh, so one of the, our assessments are we sort of try to assign a technology readiness level to uh, all of the uh, technologies that we assess, uh, so in our models, and we also have um, hydrogen combustion. Um, engines and they, I mean, according to our assessment, they are at a lower TRL compared to fuel cells. So we're seeing this technology having a lower efficiency and being lower in the TRL scale. Therefore, I mean, in, of course, nothing uh, is impossible, but we do see this technology as fairly disadvantaged compared to alternatives. And also, I think from OEM's side, they're mainly dedicated focus on, on this, at least on the declaration side, on that rather than on, on, on having hydrogen on conventional engines. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's very, there's very limited announcement compared to battery electric or even fuel cell, even at this stage. Um, okay, so that leads us quite nicely into another question, which is that you showed on that, I think it was pretty much the last slide, uh, it was a number of technologies you felt could come into this sphere to help across, not just transport, but the whole piece. Out of those that you've showed up there, which ones do you think had the most promise? Yeah. In terms of which are, are going to be to have i mean the point is that the technologies that we are looking on they are already on the demonstration level mm. so it's not that technology that they don't exist or we're waiting something the key component there is that what i mean and what we are trying to assess is it's what it's necessary to be done in order to bring that from demonstration level to the market and this is where we see government that they need to play a role there first of all to secure the environment to make sure that we are heading towards like net zero by 2050. This clearly gives a clear signal to the market and also to direct investments there in order to mobilize also private investments in order to make this a reality. So, I mean, also Leo can add on the DRL level analysis that we had already looked at what level it's these technologies, but all of these technologies are really probably to come in the market mm -hmm. over okay. the coming decade. 
the key question is, as I said before, also for hydrogen, is how quickly you can do that and at what cost in order to make them competitive to, to do that. Because we are talking about what is happening on the next 30 years, and it's important what is going to happen in the next 10 years in order to be able to reach this target. Yeah. I think that in, in terms of the, the technologies, and I mean, all, all of those technologies that we have there are technologies that are necessary, you know, to be deployed at, at some level to, to reach, uh, sort of to reach net zero. Now, the question of you know, which technology, uh, you know, is more promising or less promising depends on each specific route. If there are two alternatives that might deliver um, uh, zero carbon sort of energy services. You know? Um, and that will depend on the sector. So we have, for, I mean, that, one of the cases was between, uh, or it is between battery electric vehicles and fuel cell vehicles. No? So one can question about that. Uh, but for all, you know, all of those technologies are required to some degree. Uh, of course, some might be more successful and might outcompete uh, sort of an alternative, uh, but at least, you know, one of them will have, will have to make it to, to high market shares if we are to reach net zero by 2050. It yeah, also exactly. depends also its country strategy. For example, we have seen Japan, Korea, they're pushing a lot for uh, fuel cells and hydrogen on this. So probably they will go higher shares on that. Other markets, like they will go for another option. So it depends also with which with the country, which is going to, to pick up which of the different route it's going pathway to follow that. Yeah, and that'll be a function of, like you said, their natural resources, their technical expertise that they have existing in the country already so that yeah but i appreciate the point that you know that those but i'm not sure how many there was but probably at least 20 technologies there and yeah there will be there will be potential for a, a large number if not necessarily all to take some role in in, in the energy transition as we move forward um there for me so just okay. to point out on one of the resources that we that we publish is this clean energy uh, technology uh, guideline um, and what we do there is that we try to list all of the technologies that we find uh, that we seem sort of to be necessary. Mm -hmm. We assess their TRL level and sort of their role in our scenarios. And so there we have sort of to as much granularity as is sort of uh, reasonable for an organization covering the entire energy sector, try to give our assessment on, on most technologies. So this is something that you can find uh, on our website and it might be of, uh, of interest. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that actually comes to this, you know, a number of questions on the list here around, you know, availability of raw materials versus your forecast and ability of peak battery capacity. And I would say that, you know, having read your reports that you do make very, very clear what you're taking into account in terms of the spectrum of different scenarios. So um, that that's why maybe, you know, on, on the higher end, you're maybe higher than some people might think. And then, but you do also uh, caveat that with the different scenarios that you have there. I would say that, uh, from a point of view of questions, I think we've worked through them. There are, like I said, there are a number that sort of cover similar ground around that availability of various points in the supply chain. But I don't know if you guys want to have a closing statement on that, but to my mind, you have answered that already. Um, so in that case, I think, you know, we've come up to just under an hour. I think we can say thank you very much for a really, really insightful presentation. Um, yeah, good, a, a huge amount of ground covered as well. So. Uh, it's inevitable that there will be questions from that. Uh, is there any way that people can contact you or are you, are you open to people contacting you if they have questions or is it info at IEA or, uh, or, or should they go through LinkedIn or Twitter for you? So what do you have? Uh, absolutely. I mean, they can reach us, we can share with you. You have already our contact details or you can yeah. just find our, our message on the IA and we can follow back to you. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, and to, most of the reports are already, I mean, freely available. For example, the Net Zero report, they can go there and they can, it's interactive, the site, and they can download our uh, projections there. And it's similar for critical minerals and also energy technology perspective. So most of the material is already freely available in our yeah. website, but happy to take some follow-up questions. Yeah, so the, yeah, the key message there being either, you know, come through us and we'll pass on your questions uh, or yeah, there's a wealth of material on the IEA site and it's, it is very uh, useful and interesting. Especially that, that, you know, those scenarios, perspectives are, are really good as a thought challenging, uh, thought provoking piece. So uh, Leonardo and Apostolos, thank you very, very much for your time. It's been a pleasure having you and um, we'll see you again soon. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.